Hello, I'm Kelly Burkhardt, and I'm the pastor here at Baptist Temple. I want to welcome you to this hour of worship on the fourth Sunday of Advent. During this very unusual year, the closer and closer that we get to Christmas, the, the more and more strange it feels that we're not all together. And so it's my hope and my prayer that these, these services that we've been recording throughout this season, I, I hope that they have been meaningful to you and have helped you to feel connected to all that's going on here and to this family of faith and, and especially to God. I want to be sure that you are aware that we're going to record a very special Christmas Eve service that will be released uh, later this week and I hope that you'll be looking for it and will participate in that service as well. But for now, I think God has something to say to us today. So I invite you now, as the prelude begins to play, I invite you to turn your mind's attention and your heart's affection on God.
Old Testament lesson today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, beginning in verse 8. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we give thanks to you for sending to us your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who demonstrates your great love for us. And we give thanks and glory to you for looking past our sins and our failures and reaching out in love. And we pray for these things in the strong name of Jesus our Lord. I wonder if you're familiar with the childhood game, where would you keep your treasure? The idea of the game is this, suppose that you had a very large amount of money, a treasure really, but some unexpected crisis has come up and, and suddenly you have to leave your treasure with someone for safekeeping. You couldn't hide it, there was no putting it in a bank or burying it under a the oak tree in the backyard, you had to give it to someone that you trusted. Who would you choose? The fun of the game, of course, was 
sitting around with a group of kids and discussing all of the character flaws and virtues of various possibilities, searching for a trustworthy person. How about the principal at school, someone might suggest? Nah, he'd probably steal it. Or, well, what about the preacher? No, that's too, too risky. He'd probably put it in the offering plate. Well, what about, what about your mother? Are you kidding? She, she'd probably spend it on something boring like groceries. And on and on the conversation would go. The search for just the right person to keep the treasure. In the mind of a child, the stakes were higher. Hold treasure, risk on something as fra fragile as the trustworthiness of another human being. Well, this morning we're continuing this series of sermons entitled, Something is About to Happen. And today I'd like for us to consider that when this something that we keep saying is going to happen, when it actually happens, it will involve people who receive it as the treasure it really is is. In God's case, the treasure was not money or gold, but the gospel. The treasure was not silver, but, but news, good news. It's not cold, hard cash, but the deep, rich, and abiding promise that when is all, all is said and done, that we are not alone. That God is finally Emmanuel, God with us, at work in our world, setting things right. That is the treasure. Despite all appearances to the contrary, there is coming a time when swords will be beaten into plowshares and peace will flow like a river. That is the treasure. The day is coming when justice will cover the earth like the sea and the, and empty barns and empty stomachs and empty hearts will be filled with grain and honey, with joy and hope. A day when the dark stain of human destruction will be bleached clean by the grace of God. That is the treasure. Now, where do you keep a treasure like that? It is a treasure more important and valuable than all of the gold in Fort Knox. But this treasure is fragile in a way. The treasure could be squandered, it could be dismissed, it could be rationalized, it could even be crucified. So you have to leave a treasure like this in a place where it'll be preserved and cherished and allowed to grow. Where will God hide this treasure? Or better yet, with whom will God entrust to keep his treasure? One way to read this first chapter of Luke's gospel is a divine version of the same game that I described a moment ago. God was searching for some place in human life to leave the treasure. And Luke gives us some clues about the kind of place that God may be looking for. I think that's what Luke wants to tell us. Luke wants to tell us the story of where God has decided to hide his treasure. Look with me at our gospel reading for this morning. It's Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. 
And now your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are rushing headlong into the holiday to come. We look at our calendars and wonder how we will get everything done in time that's been allotted to us before the big day arrives. We begin to panic at the thought of projects still to be finished and contacts, contacts that need to be made and all of the uncertainties and apprehensions about what this very unique, unique Christmas will look like. In the darkness of the season, it easily overtakes us and clouds our mind and our spirit. But you are a God of time and light. You bring hope to us as you always have through the voices of the great prophets and now through the one who is to come, Jesus Christ. Remind us again what this season is truly about. Love and, and hope and peace and joy. Calm us down and slow us down. And help us to remember that it is in loving relationships that you gave your son to us and it is in loving relationships that your word is carried into the hearts of the people. No tinsel or ribbons or tape or cards can convey the eternal message adequately. You've given us the true light to shine on our path and cut through our darkness. And so we pray that you would shine in the hearts of your people today. Bless those dear ones in our church family who are sick or suffering today. Bless them with your healing and reconciling and comfort and your presence and your love. Give strength to all who face difficult decisions and let your compassionate light shine on them, guiding their decisions and their steps. Bring us at last to your presence, where the light of hope and love continually pour out on us. These prayers and hopes we offer in confidence and gratitude for your love and your presence, and we pray that you would more clearly show us the saving Messiah, who himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
As I said a moment ago, Luke is telling us the story of where God decided to keep his treasure. And this is the way that Luke begins. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, he says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, and it's almost as if he is saying, now, now there is a possibility. God could have left the treasure with the Herods of the world, with the politicians, the ones who pave the roads and collect the taxes, the ones who build the schools and pass the laws, the ones who command the armies and provide the care for the weak. God could have left the treasure with, with Herod, and it's not as strange as a possibility as you might think it is. After all, the, the treasure is at least partially political. The treasure is the news that God is at work in the world to, to pull tyrants off of their high horses and to lift up those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice. It is the news that God is at work to to break the deadlocks and to fill the bowls with food and to send the greedy away empty-handed. It is the news that, that every valley shall be exalted and every hill made low, and that is not about real estate. It's about politics. And since it is political, it would have made sense for, for God to tr entrust the treasure with the movers and the shakers, the herods of the world. God didn't leave the treasure with Herod because the gospel is the good news that if there is to be justice in the world, there can only be one king. If there's to be peace in the world, there can only be one ruler. If there is to be mercy, there can be only be one true Lord, and his name is not Herod. The people of great political power like Herod and modern-day politicians, they know in their souls what we perhaps have passed over too lightly, and that is that God's presence in the world, it means that their reign and their power are coming to an end. That's why we later find out that Herod doesn't try to, to preserve or to protect the treasure, but, but he instead tries to destroy it. For Herod, the gospel is news that is too bad to be endured, too threatening to his power, to be allowed to continue to exist. Luke wants us to see that God had to find another place to leave the treasure. So the story continues. Again, in verse 5, he, he says that in those days of Herod, and then he goes on to tell us about a priest named Zechariah. Luke is telling us, well, there's another possibility. God could have left the treasure with the Zechar Zechariahs of the world, the ones who think only holy thoughts and handle holy things and perform holy deeds. And it's not a strange thought because Zechariah is a priest. Priests are theologians of a sort, and after all, the treasure is in part theological. The treasure is the good news that it is God who is at work to set things right. It is God who gathers up all efforts of human goodwill and gives them strength beyond their measure, mercy beyond their depth and hope, beyond their grandest dreams. It is God who has made us and God who is with us and God who will reclaim us. There are signs that suggest that God may have considered leaving the treasure with this priest, Zechariah. He was an ordinary priest with an ordinary priestly responsibilities of burning incense and making sacrifices at the temple. He had done the ordinary thing of marrying Elizabeth, who herself was the daughter of a priest. But he and Elizabeth had one very extraordinary problem. They had no children because Elizabeth was barren and for reasons that have to do with the culture of the first century century that was a pain to them both and an embarrassment particularly to Elizabeth and then one day in the temple when Zechariah was lighting the incense God almost as a way of testing to see if Zechariah were a good place to leave 
for the treasure, God gave Zechariah a taste of the good news, a, a, an anticipatory glimpse of the treasure. An angel appeared to him and told him in verses 13 and following, he said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, your heart has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Zechariah, the one who thought holy thoughts, who handled holy things and performed holy deeds, proved that he was not the right place to put the treasure. Zechariah, so familiar with the holy, he finally could not believe the presence of the holy when it, when it intruded into his life. He asks, how can I be sure of this? I need proof, he whined. And in a scene of great sadness, the angel reaches forth toward Zechariah's lips, saying, you will be silent, you will be unable to speak, for you did not believe my word. For Herod, the treasure was too threatening to his power to allow it to continue to exist. For Zechariah, well, it was just too amazing to be believed. I think there is an overfamiliarity with holy things, which ironically can make you and me, it can make us numb to the intrusion of the holy in our lives. The novelist and essayist Danny Diller has written about this kind of overfamiliarity with the holy. And she says that she doesn't really understand, or she, I'm sorry, she doesn't find modern day Christians to have a true sense of what is actually taking place when we attend worship services like this one. She thinks of church people in worship that were. We're like children who think we're playing around with a chemistry set, but we're actually mixing up a batch of TNT. Instead, she suggests, well, well she, she goes on to say it would be mad, it, that it is madness for ladies to wear straw hats to worship. Instead, she suggests that we should all be wearing crash helmets and ushers should be issuing life preservers and signal flares and they should lash us to our pews with something like seat. However, because you and I are too familiar with the holy things, we too have become numb to the intrusion of the, of the holy treasure in our lives. Again, for Herod, the treasure was too bad to be endured. For Zechariah, it was too good to be true. But what about you? What do you think about God's treasure? Your answer to that question is of paramount importance. Amen.
our Heavenly Father, as we joyfully await the glorious coming of Christ, we pray for the needs of our church, our community, and our world. For you have given us a sign of your love through the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one promised in ages past. O God of hope, you visited your servants with news of the world's redemption in the coming of the Savior. Make our hearts also leap with joy and fill our mouths with songs of praise that we may announce glad tidings of peace and welcome the Christ into our midst. For it is he whom we praise and adore and in whose precious and most holy name we pray. Amen. We remember that all that we have is God's. It is as an act of worship with joyful hearts and out of an abundance of riches that we return to God a portion of that with which he has blessed us. We have provided for you four ways to give your tithes and your offerings as well as your year-end tax-deductible gifts to this church. You may give by mail, online on our website, by sending a text message from your smartphone, and by using the new BT mobile app. Give generously. Give as God leads you. And during this time of offertory, devote yourselves to God in heart and in mind and in spirit.
Where will God leave the treasure? Well, God will not leave the treasure with the Herods of the world. They would destroy it. God did not leave it with the Zechariahs of the world because well, they couldn't believe it. God didn't leave it in the capital or in the sanctuary. He didn't leave it in the palace or under the altar. Once he has eliminated those possibilities, it is then that Luke tells us the big surprise. That God left the treasure in a place which was in that time the most unusual of all places, the, the least likely of all places. God left the treasure in the womb of a woman. And Luke also tells us that the first time that the gospel is proclaimed by human lips, it's not in the Roman Senate or in the Holy of Holies. It is not by Caesar or the high priest. It happens in a conversation between two women, Mary and Elizabeth, about their pregnancies. God left the treasure in a woman's womb and it's in a conversation about stretch marks and swollen ankles that the good news of the treasure is first proclaimed. For Herod, the, the news was too bad to be endured. For Zechariah, it was news too amazing to be believed. But for Mary, who was too unimportant to be counted, it was too good not to be true. Maybe Luke wants us to know that the treasure of the gospel, which will one day fill the earth with its power, must first be planted in those weak and helpless places which yearn for it most. Those places that hunger for it most deeply and thus can believe and cherish it most fully. So we can probably rest assured that when God's something finally does happen, that the most likely place it will happen is not in the White House or in the Vatican or even here at Baptist Temple. It's the places of weakness in our lives. It's the places of weakness in our world which are most open to the amazing intrusions of God's presence. God does not come to that part of us that swaggers through life, confident of our self-sufficiency. God rather leaves the treasure in broken places where we cannot make it on our own. God does not come to us in that part of us that brushes aside all, all that threatens our status or bores or bothers us. God comes to us in those rare moments when we transcend our own selfishness long enough to, to glimpse the needs of others and to feel those needs deeply enough to hunger and thirst for God to set it right. And the rest of the good news is that on a dark night at Bethlehem, the treasure that was entrusted to Mary was born in a manger and became the treasure for us all. Something very important happened in that moment. And that baby in a manger would grow up and tell his followers to watch and to be on guard and to be alert because something more is about to happen. And we have sufficient evidence to say with great certainty that God is again looking for someone he can trust to be the recipient of his treasure. In other words, something is about to happen. You must simply decide whether or not you want to be included when it does. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. And as you remember God's Son born in Bethlehem, may you also remember God's Spirit in your heart. May you follow the light of the stars in your dreams and know that God is with you wherever you may go. Let the hope that was born in a stable be a sign that God's presence in our, in our lives, it can change the world both 2,000 years ago and today. And may the spirit of Advent warm your hearts all year long. Grace and peace be with you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.